What I'd like to do is sort of talk about um, what is nature of science, uh, why is it important to teach, and um, how can we go about teaching it. So let us start by sort of doing what scientists do. And the first thing maybe scientists do is observe. So I'm going to ask you to look at this image and tell me what you see. If, if you have happened to see this before, um, let others sort of enjoy the experience. Um, so when you look at this, what do you see? Yeah. A cow. A cow. What else? Yeah. An elf. Hmm? An elf. Elf? Mm, what, what, what part <laughs> where you see the elf? This side or that side? That side. That side. What else? Yeah. Looks like some kind of map or satellite picture. Sort of a mm -hmm. sort of topographical map or, or satellite picture. Yeah. yeah. A skier in a mountain. Looking down the hill. Looking down and from that end here? Is yeah, that there's sort of a peak and there's a, in the bottom uh, right corner is a grand tree. Okay. Yes? Perhaps I shouldn't say this, but I think, at first I saw it, I think that it was Tsimi's come and his in coming. <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe that's, that's it. Um, any other things you can see here? So of course the question is, um, how come we're looking at the same thing and seeing different things? <laughs> I mean, after all, it is the same thing, right? How come we look at this and we see different things? Yeah. Well, I'm smarter than the others, so I saw the right thing. <laughs> you saw the right thing, which is what? <laughs> it's a cow. It's a cow. Um, anybody else can see a cow? <laughs> you didn't see the cow at the beginning, did you see it from the get-go? In the beginning. In the beginning. Mm. You see the cow? No. <laughs> well, let me make you see the cow. So, so let us say that there's a cow here. This would be its nostrils here. These are the eyes. Here's one ear. So you see it now? Yes. <laughs> Which is really it's a cow. Um, <laughs> so um, the, the question, of course, that um, usually comes up is, um, how do we see? Do, do we see with our eyes or do we see with our minds? What would you say? You're smarter than everybody, so... <laughs> <laughs> How do you see? With your eyes or with your mind? Well, uh, it's funny because, you know, I've been thinking about these things, so I, I first realized that, okay, my first impression is, is the cow, I, I see it here, and then I start, you know, if you can show back the picture, sure. there's something next sure. to it, uh, uh, well, from our point of view, the right ear, there's this <laughs> kind of like peak that you said that is something like a key or something like that, so then I start checking, hmm, is this peak, does it, you know, fit into the picture of cow, <laughs> would it be a part of cow, hmm, <laughs> well, it's, it's probably, it's, you know, the, the peak that they have in the end of their spine, yeah, right. or between the neck and spine. Yeah, so, yeah, okay, it fits my theory, so, yes, it's a cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have to go through what I see before I, you know, uh, say that it's... So you're saying it's sort of some sort of negotiation between what you're seeing and what you're thinking yeah. in many ways, mm -hmm. which, which is, I think, really interesting. But anyway, um, all, all this is interesting, but um, what does it have to do with science? Um, you know, that's always a, a very um, a interesting question. Um, By show of hands, how many of you, uh, well, let me just quickly tell you about this history. X-rays were discovered by uh, Rottingen at the University of Munich in 1895. And N-rays were discovered by um, physicist uh, René Blondlaw at the University of Nancy, closely after that in 1903. And uh, this is Blondlaw's experimental setup. So what he had is he had just a simple um, light source at one end that was inside um, a corrugated iron um, um, case. And when he would start the gas lamp, N rays would be emitted um, through this aluminum window, which made sure no light was emitted, but just the N rays. And then he would use a um, quartz prism to sort of focus the N rays. And this sheet, he can block the N rays or let them go. 
and the end rays then will be detected by the slight change of intensity um, on a um, spark at this induction point. Um, but Longlow um, sort of was said it was very, very hard to see the very um, slight changes in intensity as the electricity changes. So what he would do, he'd turn off the lights and you would have to go into his lab and um, take some time to get used to the darkness and you could not look at the spark directly, you have to look at it obliquely to sort of see the small changes in intensity as he was sort of letting the end rays um, come in and, and out. So it, it was very, very interesting. And so um, between the years uh, 1903 and 1906, N-rays were observed by at least 40 people and analyzed in some 300 published papers by some 100 scientists and medical doctors um, in that period. Um, by show of hands, how many of you have heard of N-rays? Okay. One, two, three, <laughs> others have not heard of N-rays? Why? I mean, why would you not heard of N-rays? Most of you are now successful science teachers and researchers. And haven't really heard of them. Well, we haven't heard of them because actually they do not exist. Um, and what's really interesting is, this is one of the um, phenomena in science where um, people have seen something, published about it, did a lot of research, um, but it turns out that it is actually not real. And it turns out that um, James Wood was really, is, is an American scientist who did a really interesting experiment with Long Low to, to sort of like um, debunk the end rays. And that was a very famous episode in the history of science. So Wood shows up in the lab, looks at the experimental setup, and quickly figures out that something is wrong here. And so he's done right there in the lab what would be a great double-blind experiment. So they turned off the lights. Longlo was on this end of the experimental setup. His assistant was on that end. And then they would move the um, sheet, this sheet, up and down. And Longlo would sort of think intensity and rays, no intensity and rays, and so on and so forth. And so when it was dark, Wood sort of walked towards the instrument and quietly removed that prism there, the prism that supposedly focuses the end rays, he removed it. And then Blondlo on the other end was still calling the shots. He was saying, yes, end rays, no end rays, end rays, no end rays. And sort of, he was seeing what he was supposed to see when he was not supposed to see it. So they turned the lights on, and Blondlo's assistant was very sus suspicious. So he went to Blondlo and said, this guy removed the prism, you know, so I, I think something is wrong here. So Blondlo said, let's do this again, let's do this again, this is not working. So they turned off the lights, the prison is there, and then they started the experiment and Wood walks audibly in the dark towards the instrument, but he does not remove the prison. <laughs> but now Blondlo is reversed. He was seeing end rays when he was not supposed to see end rays and not seeing them when he was supposed to see them. <laughs> and so Wood published those results and sort of like, um, you know, that was the end of it, right? But, you know, science is different today um, compared to the 1900s. We, we, we really sort of do a lot of exact measurements in science, and I think we, we should be beyond these things. But, but let's do something else. Let's look at some other things. What do you see in, in this image? Some people tell me it's the floor of at the hairdresser after they cut your hair. I mean, that's <laughs> obviously one. one. Um, any ideas? This is what happens when, um, when actually you take two beams of particles and you sort of really get them to move very fast inside the large hadron collider and then smash them together and collect that sort of information on screens. So what's interesting is, um, this is the result, these are data that scientists get. And how do they make sense of something like this? I mean, how do they actually get to sort of say, here's a lepton, here's a quark, or, or you know, there's a boson particle. How do they do that? In, in science, observations or data are always motivated and guided by, and they acquire meaning in light of questions and in light of evidence, and in light of theory. 
So uh, in that sense, Karl Popper used to have this exercise in his classroom. He would come to his students and he would say, okay, take out paper, pencil, observe. And his students would say, observe what? And he goes, aha. <laughs> so, you know, when, when you think about um, um, observation or evidence in science, um, these things have meaning only in light in terms of theory and questions that you sort of uh, work with. Um, here's a quote from Darwin, who was writing to one of his friends. Um, he was, and of course it's back in the, in the 1850s. About 30 years ago there was much talk that geologists ought only to observe and not to theorize. And then he writes how odd it is that anyone should not see that all observations must be for or against some view if it's to be of any service. Which has, I think is really interesting. So this interaction between theories and laws, uh, between sorry, theory and observation, is one of the aspects of what we call nature of science. And it talks to what we call the theory-laden or theory-driven nature of science, whereby scientists' theoretical, disciplinary commitments, beliefs, prior knowledge, training, do impact the choice of problems they investigate, how they investigate it, what observations they look for, and how they make sense or construct these observations. So this is just one example of an aspect of nature of science that we usually work with. Um, another important part of, 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 um, na of course, nature of science is the scientific method. And so, what is the scientific method? I mean, some of you are going to be teachers, and most likely you're going to go and sort of talk to this about you, to your students. Well, I'll, I'll save you the trouble. I, I you know, asked this question, went to Google, said what's the scientific method, and sort of started downloading these images. And you could see there's always some set of steps, observing, questioning, hypothesizing, experimenting, concluding, communicating. There were tons of these things on the web. You know, what did you observe? Look at, it's always starting with observation, right? Which is really interesting. It's like, so you could imagine somebody walking saying, ha, I observed something, I'm gonna do science. Um, Sometimes they sort of link them up and down, and, and um, but the one that I really love, of course this is like sort of circular, was the one by graduate student. Um, this is the scientific method, the actual method. So the scientific method is observe natural pheno phenomena, formulate the hypothesis, test it, modify it. But the real one, which is by the PhD site, is make up theory based on what funding agency manager wants to be true. <laughs> Design minimum experiments that prove no, show, no, suggest theory is true. Publish paper, rename theory, hypothesis, pretend, use the scientific method, and, and so on and so forth. So what's, what's, what's really interesting is that um, scientific method is part and parcel of the life of uh, the culture of school science. Um, every almost, I've, I've done a lot of analysis of science textbooks, and a lot of science textbooks have very explicit quotes about, um, you know, like phys physics, like all other sciences, is based on the scientific method, and then they go to sort of list these steps. On the web, you can find quizzes about what is the scientific method. Here's an example of a test that comes from Science Fundamentals, in which they ask students, what is the first step of the scientific method? Is it forming a hypothesis? Is it making an observation? Is it performing a, and so on and so forth? Um, I've done a lot of research on nature of science. I've talked to kids in grades three all the way to Nobel laureates in science. And for many kids, they talk about how the nature of science, uh, how scientific method is drilled in their heads. Uh, here's a quote from a secondary science teacher. That is like how the science textbooks goes about it. I don't think that that is the only way you can go about doing science, but that's what has been drilled into my head. And almost every chapter one of every scientific textbook or science textbook has a scientific method. So there's a lot of people who said that this recipe, the way for doing science, is, um, is um, um, very um, um, too simplistic. What they've tried to talk about is sort of see how um, scientific method is a more interactive set of ways in terms of it being a set of testing ideas, they talk about community analysis and feedback, benefits and outcomes, observations and discovery and so on and so forth. And within each one of these circles, if you like, things are a little bit more complicated. So they try to talk about, you know, what is it about exploring science that works in and so on and so forth. But the really interesting stuff they do, and I, I encourage you to sort of visit, visit their website, it's called, if you type in Berkeley, you know, uh, the real method of science or whatever, 
is they went and tried to do these highly sophisticated case studies in which they actually interviewed scientists and tried to reconstruct how they went about doing the science. And they have several case studies. One of them is the um, aerosols, the discovery of the um, uh, hydrofluorocarbons and how that was impacting the, the internet. And so, sorry, the ozone layer. And then they would go and try to follow the path of, of how the scientists went about it. And this would be the story of the um, discovery of the ozone depletion. And the point to keep in mind is, these are the actual stories of how this happened. And you can see it in real time moving. And you could already see that there's a number of quote unquote steps that are not part of it. And there's a number of things that are several times part of it, going back and forth and back and forth. And they have several case studies. Another really interesting case study is the um, uh, discussion about the dinosaur extinction um, and how that happened. And when you plot that story, this is what you end up with. But what's interesting is when you put these things side to side, actually when you put each one of their case studies side to side, what do you see? You see it's a completely different pathway <laughs> to, to sort of doing this. So to my mind, one of the things that I've been um, sort of talking about is this sort of myth of scientific method. Uh, it is true that scientists do a whole host of activities like experimenting, hypothesizing, debating, creating ideas, lobbying, whatever you want to think about it. But there isn't really a recipe. There isn't a, 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 a single set of steps that somehow take you from point A to point B to get you to be, um, to reach valid conclusions. And in that sense, um, it's, it's really hard because we keep trying to portray to students, we tell them that in the textbooks, that there's this recipe that they follow when they do science, which I think is, is, is not a good, good way to do this. As Albert Einstein says, uh, you know, physical concepts are free creations of the human mind and are not, however, it may seem uniquely determined by the external world. And he was just talking about another important aspect of nature of science, which is creativity. You know, science is a very rational activity, but it's not entirely rational in that sense. It is a blend of logic and imagination. And generating scientific knowledge involves a lot of human creativity. The image of um, nature of science, however unfortunate that our students are left with, is an image that is plowed by procedures and, and you know, the, 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 the um, um, steps, and it's kind of not really, um, if you ask students, they say, oh, science is boring, it's, it's just these set of steps, and, and we don't like to, to sort of work with it. So in that genre, we talk about a number of important aspects of nature of science that we would like students to sort of learn about. Uh, sort of um, how science is based on evidence, but it's not only about the evidence. We, we'd like them to understand the nature of scientific theories, the nature of scientific laws, how science itself is a social activity. Yesterday, they were, you were telling me about how you have students visit the Luma Center here, and mm -hmm. some they get to see that scientists sit together and talk to each other. It's like, wait, these people work together? And so that's not the image that we help construct um, in the science classroom. And so, over the years, we've been developing a number of ideas that we would like students to sort of learn about in terms of nature of science. For those who are interested in research, there are some issues related to, to uh, uh, the uh, uh, defining nature of science. One of them these, these days now are this talk about domain general, which is like aspects about nature of science that might cut across all the sciences versus domain specific, which are aspects of nature of science that are specific to a um, to a discipline like chemistry or physics or biology. If you're interested, um, Valle Mati will be talking about this in his dissertation. Um, I did issue a number of challenges to people who uh, are advocating the domain-specific parts, um, which is I still have to see a serious analysis by them to show me that some of the domain general aspects actually do not apply to, 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 to the whole of um, science. The other thing is, um, they argue sometimes that by getting, by using domain specific nature of science, you get away from problems that associate with trying to sort of say there's something that applies across the sciences. Um, but it, it just really doesn't work that way. Um, in my own university, the biology department has split a number of years ago into integrated biology and molecular biology because they felt that biology itself was not as unified as everybody says. So if you talk about nature of biology, 
um, then what are you talking about? Nature of integrated biology or nature of molecular biology or nature of physiology? And so, uh, I, so I'm sort of prepping you for some of your questions tomorrow. But anyway, that's what we really wonder what this is about. But another important thing in, in talking about nature of science here is that we do understand that there are issues and debates and um, ongoing controversies in philosophy and history and sociology and psychology of, of science um, that sort of um, says we don't really know, we cannot nail down what this thing science is. And so the approach that has been used in science education is what we call the consensual approach. Sort of say, look, it's true that we cannot nail down what science is, but we do know that what we're teaching some of our students about the scientific method, about the truth, about the fact that uh, science is just a collection of facts, that's not true. So we might as well teach them something that is at least a little bit more informed. So in that sense, uh, the consensual approach um, tries to sort of say, what are some things we can teach our students? For example, we know that scientists are very creative people. We know that they work together and check on their work. Science is not like a lonely procedural activity. Why shouldn't we be teaching that? But by doing that, uh, people have tried to uh, sort of shove away the controversies, right? We, we just want to put them under the rug for a while. And I think what we need to move forward in the field is actually to embrace the controversial nature of science. And in that sense, I've been suggesting to sort of work within what we call a developmental framework for nature of science. Whereby if you think as students go from elementary school to secondary school and then you guys come here to be in teacher education, we can move the way we talk about nature of science from very simple, unproblematic postulates, which are nonetheless informed, to more problematic um, uh, uh, understandings of nature of science that we can sort of like guide students along a developmental pathway. Consider, for example, the empirical nature of science. We really want our elementary students to understand that science demands evidence that scientific knowledge is derived from, or at least is consistent with, observations of the natural world. We want them to understand that we need to ask them, what is your evidence every time they have a claim? Now, when, when students are in secondary school, we really want to start to get them to understand that a theory can only be tested by comparing consequences with empirical observations. You can't go and put a, a thousand buffaloes in a field and observe them for a million years and see of, if uh, evolution happens. It doesn't work that way, right? Um, and so in that sense, we want them to understand that a hypothesis doesn't jump from evidence. There's inference that you need to engage with. There's interpretation, so creativity comes in. But the relationship between your claim and your evidence has to involve theory. Now, when you're a teacher, I really want you now to understand even more problematic that scientific theories is what we call are underdetermined by evidence, meaning more than one theory can explain the same set of evidence, right? So in that sense, it's not for you to go and teach this to elementary students, but to really have a sophisticated understanding of nature of science that allows you to work in that realm. The other thing that is really important is why do you even care about teaching the nature of science to your students? And so it's really interesting that this term nature of science, at least in the US, has been part of every national reform effort since the 1940s. That's more you know, than 60, 62 years. And it's always been touted as a very central uh, goal to, to science education. Um, and the idea is that it would enable you know, 21st century students who are going to become citizens or yourselves to sort of deal with um, issues related to science. And, and this is actually true because <laughs> science is undeniably all over. It's part and parcel of your life and the life of your students and our lives. Um, you know, ranging from genetically manufactured uh, foods to um, pollution and saving the environment to um, coal burning and clean coal. That's what we're trying to promote in the U.S. now. And I think this is very uh, um, clear now. This is the, the, the perils of nuclear power and clean, sustainable energy. This is the photo of the Fukushima plant at the time of, of that explosion. Um, there's also the issues of the extinction of um, uh, biodiversity uh, on Earth. So for your students and for you and for us, science is all over the world. And what's really important for um, us to think about is how can students who are going to become future citizens deal with making responsible decisions or dealing with some of these issues 
um, uh, are they able to make informed decisions and choices when they're asked to think about biodiversity or nuclear energy or clean energy? And are they even capable of keeping up with what it takes to make sense of this? The problem is that keeping up with science is really, really hard. Just before coming here, I just went in the Social Science Citation Index and, and just looked at how many published articles just in the, in the, uh, nature, uh, in the natural sciences and they came up with about 40,000 published articles just in the years 2010 to 2011. The rate at which science is being produced is just amazing. And so if, if your students were to look at this and figure it out, this is what they will come up with. It's really frustrating. But it's not such a really hard thing to think about because when we think about science, it's really a large body of knowledge and it's also it's generated and validated through a set of methods and processes both of these are justified by science being an epistemological endeavor. The, the, um, the good thing about this is that by understanding epistemology of science or nature of science, you can have a guide or a meta way of thinking about science that would help you work through this. The problem is that if you think about how we teach science in schools, we focus a lot on science as a body of knowledge, a little bit less at science as a set of processes or methods, and this is how much science as a way of knowing, if you don't see this, this is actually science as a way of knowing. So, um, <laughs> when I did some analysis of um, uh, science textbooks in the US, I looked at chemistry, physics, and biology textbooks. This is the sort of image that looks like. Less than 2% of science textbooks are actually talk about nature of science, because they're mostly concerned with talking about science as a body of knowledge, and talking maybe about the interactions between science and society and science processes. And this is sort of close to some of the figures that you have found uh, in that sense. Students, your students, are going to be um, overwhelmed by images um, from uh, everyday life that claim something that is scientific. Uh, because the authority of science is really interesting. I, I just done, done some, um, put in scientific methods in Google and your students are likely to see how these things from um, muscle enhancement that are scientifically proven, and these are quotes from the internet, to the pillowcase that is scientifically proven um, to sort of like give you the best night's sleep, to the spa in Edinburgh that is scientifically proven to do all of this stuff for you. And so um, uh, it's really interesting how these things show up um, all over uh, the, plot, the, 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 the world. Of course, in countries like you know, the US and, and of course in Europe, um, many of these things are regulated and if you really look at the fine print, you will see something like these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. But people use this nonetheless. And it's really important that this authority of science that everybody seems to throw around is mostly based, and of course I'm, I'm being um, very simplistic here on observing, you know, we ask our people who slept on this pillow, did you slept really well? And so they answered yes. Or they throw out the weight of the scientific method. And I think if you think about the two aspects that we covered, about the interplay between observation and theory, about the lack of scientific method, this I think is empowering for your students to sort of at least give them a sense uh, of that. In, in, instead of sort of talking about a scientific method only or about observing, we might educate our students about the peer review process, which is really, really important. Students leave high school not having a sense that scientists actually go through this process whereby they're supposed to blind their papers and send it somewhere and somebody rips it apart and send it back to you and then you spend the whole time trying to revise it and send it out. So I think all of these things are really, um, really important in, in that sense. Now, so nature of science is important for students. You want students to learn about nature of science. So we want science teachers to learn about nature of science to be able to teach about it. But that's not all. There is more to it. Because um, uh, I think teachers also need to learn about nature of science so that they can teach with it. And this is a, a concept that I've been writing about recently, which is this difference of teaching with nature of science and teaching about nature of science. So teaching about nature of science is when you in your classroom are working with your students to help them develop this sort of set of epistemological understandings about science. Teaching with nature of science is when teachers say, if scientists behave that way, or if science is that way, how should I structure my science instruction to reflect the way science actually happens in schools? 
And so indeed, if we assume that our students learn something or learn about the natural world in the same way scientists go about figuring out how the world works, there's quite a bit of things um, that um, um, we can do in our classrooms to make science learning a little bit more authentic. Here's some examples. So if you take the social nature of science, from an epistemological perspective, scientific knowledge is socially negotiated. This is not to say that science is relativistic. People miss that. Scientific knowledge is socially negotiated in the sense that there are constitutive values in the way scientists communicate, right, that underlie established values for communication. For example, um, I don't know if you've looked at any scientific publications recently, but usually scientific publications have three dates. Anybody knows what these three dates are for a scientifically published article? There's the date of submission, the date of acceptance, and the date of publication. Why do we do that? Why are there three dates on a scientifically published article? You should know that. Though. I'm just putting you on the... Okay. Why, why well, were three dates? There has to be the day it was submitted so that if someone copies what you've done, you can prove you submitted it first. Okay. So, um, so in that sense, scientists have figured out that you need to put your ideas for scrutiny by the scientific community, but you need to protect your priority, <coughs> right? So the day of submission becomes the day you can claim the idea if it's, if it's accepted. So scientists have figured out ways to actually ensure some sense of objectivity in the way they do this work. So in that sense, which is really interesting, that the objectivity in science, according to Helen Longin, who was a philosopher of science, is secured by the social character of inquiry. The fact, she says, that criticism allows the incorporation of hypotheses into the canon of scientific knowledge, which can be independent of any one individual subject of preferences, which is really interesting. But from a practical perspective, science is done in groups by individuals who work within larger communities of practice. They work and think together, they build arguments together, they write papers together. Of course, this doesn't mean scientists do not sit on their own and do work, but they're always part of communities. However, if you look into science classrooms, uh, this is how they look like. And these are purposeful. These images down here are from the 1920s in the US, 30s, 50s, 2010. And in an abstract way, this is how many science classrooms look like, right? Um, so even when we go and we do laboratory work, Basically, students learn the answer in the classroom, then you take them to the lab and do what we call verification to show them that you're right. Okay? You see, if you dip litmus, right, litmus in, 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 in base, it turns blue. You see, here it is. Um, and there has been actually a lot of improvement. I'm sure you do a lot of this in your classroom where you get your students to actually ask questions, collect and analyze data, answer these questions, present your report to you, and then you evaluate them. The problem here is that even when you do something like this, we are still missing a major part of science, which is scientists do not send their reports to journals and then they get yes or no. They get sometimes no, but some, most of the time they get, this looks interesting, but we have these following questions. And then they get a chance to go back and revise their papers, talk to others, collect more data. We don't do this in, the, in, 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 in science. This is what we really like science classrooms to look like. And in that sense, we want, even after students come up with some ideas, to present and defend their ideas to their, to their peers, to collect feedback and criticism, reflect, revise, and refine what they're doing about, and then build and represent these ideas in a set of arguments. And so if you want science to be, um, science teaching to be consistent with the way of, of doing science, we need to build in cycles whereby students get to behave like scientists get to actually present and defend their ideas, to get feedback, and then get a chance to revise what they do instead of just being scored in, 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 in that sense. Um, there are other things that you could learn from science. One of the things that I call um, go observe the fish syndrome. And um, I, I see this in a lot of elementary science classrooms. In the US, they have a lot of like fish tanks, and they have animals and stuff like that. And I was in this classroom, and the teacher got the elementary students to take their pencil and pens and go observe the, the fish in the tank. You could see these little kids going there and just writing stuff. Somebody was talking about how dirty the tank is, the others how beautiful the fish are, and so on and so forth. But the idea is um, you have to start with questions, and this happens a lot in elementary classrooms, because the theory-related nature of science actually applies to students. 
right? Students come to your classroom with very specific ideas about how the world works. Um, for example, for many students, electricity is something that flows from a source to a bulb and then light happens. They don't see a circuit, they flip the light and then the, work, the, <laughs> the power comes on, right? And so um, this whole notion that you see in science classroom whereby students are engaged with some observation, like observe, go, go observe the fish, uh, and then they should come up with some notion that's on your mind. This just doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work. Um, you've seen in many ways students plot temperature versus pressure and you want them to get the perfect line but they never get the perfect line right and then you say if this was the real laboratory there would be a perfect line the problem is that even in a real laboratory there is never a perfect line and so we engage in these sort of misrepresentations i think in in in, in science and so if you were to take nature of science seriously you would always want to start any science <coughs> investigation with meaningful questions rather than observations. You want students to sort of tell you what do they think about the phenomenon because you're trying to establish what quote unquote their theory is. And you really want them to understand what data they're collecting and how that data is related to, um, to their questions. The other really important thing is we need to understand that students sometimes actually do not see the things that you want them to see. They do not see the cow because they don't have the theoretical perspective or the interest or the motivation to do that. Um, and as teachers, you have to think about creative ways uh, to do this because interestingly enough, the theory related nature of science can speak as a positive heuristic. It helps you to uh, sort of design your lessons, but there's a, uh, it also um, helps you to understand why sometimes students just don't get it. There's a um, very uh, famous paper or work done by Clark Chin and Bill Brewer at the University of Illinois um, where they looked at how students respond to anomalous data. And most of what we do as teachers is prevent our students with anomalous data, right? Um, for example, you sort of tell them, uh, how is heat generated? Well, uh, or, or, you know, heat moves from hot bodies to cold bodies, you know, because they have this experience of drinking hot coffee or getting it or whatever. Um, and then you come to them and say, okay, here's a coin and here's a hammer, please uh, touch them, they're both cold. You put the coin and you hit it with the hammer, what happens to the coin? It's hot now. And then you say, see, heat sometimes comes from cold or, or from no heat. And they look at you and when, when you look at these things, um, Clark and uh, Bill, what they actually found is that students respond to anomalous data in the same way that scientists sometimes respond to anomalous data. They could ignore the data, reject the data, exclude the data from the domain of the theory and so on and so forth, but only in a few cases where the anomalous data is accepted and changing the theory. And this is really where students would change their quote-unquote minds about something. So in that sense, um, it's really important to understand how to design you're teaching such that data that's used in your classroom actually is meaningful to what, to what um, uh, students uh, want to do. Another really important thing is, uh, if students do not perceive science as a creative endeavor, something that they contribute to, it's really hard for them not to figure that your activities, your teaching, is just a way for them to guess what's on your mind. Many times your students say, just don't let me go through the whole process. Just tell me what you want me to learn. I'll learn it. I'll come tomorrow. I'll sit on the test and everybody will be fine. And so in, in structuring your classrooms to be consistent with science, they have to actually believe that they as individuals have something to contribute to, 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 to the way sort of we, uh, we do science. The, uh, the problem though, and this is for researchers, is that even when teachers um, seem to develop good understandings of nature of science, they're not always able to translate these understandings into, um, into the classroom for several reasons. One of them, you go to a school and your head of the department comes to you and say, this is how we do science in this school, right? You know, you're coming from a university, you have great ideas, we love that, but this is how we do it in this school. So there's always a culture pushing against that. But um, another really important thing that we are trying to do um, in um, science education now, in this research in nature of science, is trying to understand what does it take for teachers to be able to teach in ways that are consistent with nature of science. And the picture is quite complex. Um, 
So some of the work I've done with my graduate students um, seems to point out that if you were to be able to teach about nature of science in this way, you really have to have very good knowledge of your content. If you don't understand your content, forget it. And I think teachers in Finland already have a huge advantage over, over teachers in the US. We were just calculating yesterday, a teacher in the US can get a bachelor's degree in chemistry with 40 hours and go out and teach. Whereas you guys here get up to 120 hours in, in, in chemistry. So, so a deep understanding of content is important. But also an understanding of inquiry and how you can teach your science through inquiry is important. So for example, how can you actually teach the periodic table in a way that's not, here's the periodic table and here what it means, right? But it's also important to have some understanding about history of science and trying to understand how some scientific ideas develop. So, if you did not understand how the periodic table developed, you might not think this is how it's always been. And so the story of the development of the periodic table, I think, is really, really important to, uh, to the development of science. Another really important thing is, and I go through this quickly, I'll try to finish in five minutes, is how do you go about teaching the nature of science? And um, the thing that we find is out there is that there are two broad perspectives on how you can go about teaching nature of science that has two implications. One of them is called the lived perspective. And some of the folks who work in this area sort of say, you don't have to teach nature of science. All what you have to do is teach your students science or engage them with inquiry and it should be fine. Because nature of science can only be acquired implicitly through practice. As Rick Duschel says, it cannot be taught directly, rather it's learned like language by being part of a culture. Um, the, the problem with this approach is that, number one, it, it equates the process of doing science with the epistemology of science, which is a problem. Um, you know, you could have gone and be a good observer, and most of you have been good observers when you do your science, but that notion of theoreticalness might have not really come to your attention, right? So th this is two level. Um, and another um, part, the, or the other perspective, is what we call the reflective perspective. It sort of says, Nature of science doesn't come necessarily only from scientists. It comes from historians, from philosophers, from sociologists who came and started to say, how does science work? And so they spend their life trying to understand how science works. So in that sense, these folks reflect on science. And the evidence actually works on, um, on our um, uh, side because we've done quite a bit of empirical work and there's quite a bit of evidence to show that just engaging students in the doing of science doesn't necessarily get them to develop this perspective. Um, and it's really important here because we've been talking about what we call this explicit reflective nature of science instruction. This is not to say that we ask you to go in the classroom and ask students to recite after you. Science is standard. Science, I mean, this is sort of ridiculous. Um, what's really important is to think about if I'm teaching my students this inquiry activity, is it a good context for them to understand how theory is tested? That theory, you cannot look at theoretical entities. You derive implications from them and you test them against uh, evidence. How can I get them to think about this in, in, in the context of, 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 a, of a classroom? Um, um, and what pedagogical approach to use is really up to you, even though we really like you to engage students in, in, in some uh, activities. But the most important thing is to stop students at certain points in time and sort of say, OK, so you've reached this conclusion. You now said that you told me as a result of going through these things that electricity is the flow of electrons in a circuit. How did you know that? Did you see electrons flow in a circuit? No. How did you come up with this idea? And how is this claim different from observing the switch and the light come on and off and, and things of that sort? We, we, can have, um, we can ask questions about this. Anyway, I've uh, spoken for about 50, 50 minutes now. I'm going to stop. I just want to uh, thank you for listening and see if you have any questions that we can, uh, I can answer. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if you're in a chemistry laboratory and you want to find the heat capacity of a substance, you don't go and set up an experiment and try to find the heat capacity. You go to this big, thick book when I was in, now you go to Google and, and you find it. So yes, um, I've never said that, that science is not a body of knowledge. It's, it's a codified body of knowledge, that's for sure. Um, but how you get to that codified body of knowledge is not going around and collecting facts. 
Generating that body of knowledge is a process that most of the time involves something other than just collecting the fact. There's this famous story about this guy who collected this huge set of beetles and he wanted to present it to the German um, science society, this is back like in the 1850s. And it's like, this is for me to you to advance the science. And somebody asked them, why did you collect these beetles? Well, I just collected beetles. Were you trying to answer a specific set of questions? You know what I'm trying to say? So there's no doubt that science has a codified body of knowledge. Um, now, how we got to that knowledge is what students miss. Right? Um, and most of the time, the most important thing is you don't come to the University of Helsinki work wandering around, you observe something, it says, ha, huh, I want to study that. You come into a course, you, you, you study that course, and then if you go into a master's degree, maybe or a PhD, you become part of your professor's laboratory and they assign you a little part of the world and you already have a whole lot of things working. So you just have to keep that in mind when you get students to explore some of these ideas. Um, even if you want them to learn about density, you do um, structure it such that they explore the phenomena, but at least you know where they're going and you structure your, your um, um, lessons or ideas so that they can somehow get to make this conclusion. So I think that is really important to do that. The other thing that is really important is, so you're saying, for example, students want to know something, they go on Google and they Google it. And that's a good way to do it. But then, they have, you find 100 million hits on Google, or let's say just 50 hits. I don't want to say 10,000 hits. The next thing is to judge whether, which one of these 50 answers you want to believe, right? So by understanding something about uh, the process of science, they're a little bit more um, smart about it. So for example, if you are reading about the value of some cereal, and they said there's a great study that showed or proved that this is great and it was conducted by the Kellogg professor at the University of Stanford. So, so this is a professor in nutrition whose chair is endowed by the Kellogg Corporation. By default, you want to ask some questions, right? The other thing you want to say, where was this published? Who did the study? Was it peer-reviewed or not? So what I'm trying to say is by understanding something about how science is produced, the students become smarter consumers of this knowledge that is such a huge body of facts. Maybe that's how I'm approaching it. Um, so, and I tried to sort of model this in a, in, a, in a minute way here. So instead of coming here and uh, sort of say to you, looking at the same thing in the world, we can come up with different claims. I could have started my talk like this, but instead I sort of showed you that image. I was trying to give you a mini experience before I reach a conclusion. And this was meant to sort of sh exactly speak to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Which is, you cannot get students to um, experience um, inquiry by talking about it. Right? Uh, the difference between what I'm talking about and what, you know, somebody like Eric Duschel or Bill Sandoval or others are talking about is I say, inquiry is important actually it's necessary. It's just not sufficient if you want your students to learn about something like this. That's all what I'm saying. So, um, the question is, we, in many places of the world, you struggle to, to, just to get teachers to do inquiry, right? Um, here, my sense is just visiting the schools and, and looking at what of some of the things are doing, there's a lot of chances. There's a lot of um, uh, experiences that your students get. Now, uh, I'm just thinking about the group that was visiting yesterday with the laboratory here or that went to the physics department to look at molecular model. Okay? So, they were playing with the molecules, right? And, and shifting it. And Maria, what's, what's, who was next to me, she said, look, we don't have the same molecule with the same color on any of these models. Because we don't want students to think that individual models have these macro properties. Mm -hmm. My question is, I wonder, do you ever take the time to talk to students about this? So students have come along, they've experienced the model, which is great, because now um, they are really being able to see this 3D representation to manipulate this, but where in the process, after they've gone through this, do you say, hey, by the way, if you look across these computers, 
Do you see that the oxygen is not red all the time or that, right? You know why we do that? Because this is a representation. This is not how a molecule necessarily looks like. This is a tool for us to help us to think. That latter part, that's a part about reflection. That's a part where let's peel one layer down and talk about the epistemological dimension. You don't need to tell students this is epistemology or philosophy. That's not the point. You don't want to produce philosophers. But for them to understand that, don't think. Um, because in chemistry, everybody knows here that um, one of the misconceptions that students have, um, there's a famous question, I don't know that this is George Bodner and Mary Nathalie who developed this, but they would ask students, would a single atom of gold have the color of gold? What, what would you guys answer? Your chemistry teachers. It doesn't, right? And there's, there's a difference between the micro and the macro and all the stuff. Most students in schools would answer, of course, because it's the thing and you just take it apart and small and small and there's no sense of, of, this, of this. So again, um, uh, you know, to answer your question, we already do a lot of inquiry. We already do a lot of investigation. The question is how can we add that one additional layer that tells us it's not going to happen on its own, right? Um, if students come here and see this big group of scientists sitting in a group. Um, they watch them from a distance and they go back saying, wow, these scientists work together, this is great. I thought scientists was like crazy hair and they just blow things up in a lab. But it doesn't mean that they left here understanding the nature of that collaboration, right? The nature of the fact that you vet your ideas next to the water cooler, but also in, in meetings, but then you try to write about it and talk to your colleagues. And that is a way to negotiate the knowledge in that sense.